I am happy to say Papa Roanoke has finally come back with some more Metro lore. So with Metro Exodus finally out, our team is tasked with exploring different areas in an attempt to accomplish his goals. It is also exceedingly hard not to talk about what he does considering it's such a new game and I am attempting to limit spoilers. That being said, the mutants themselves are not really spoilers, so here we go. During his mission in the far reaches of Russia, he begins to run across more and more of the same mutants as seen in Moscow. However, one creature in particular is interesting as it retains roughly 90% of its human traits, but has still become a beast in the process of living on the surface. We are, of course, discussing the humanimal today, which is a very strange word in itself. So with that set up, let's dive into the lore and morphology of this creature in an attempt to determine what exactly happened to it. So something of a little bit of a downer before we hit that. Uh, real quick, I know it's annoying and I wish I didn't have to ask, but after speaking with YouTube, basically I was told that the notifications button now has to have you enable all notifications on it. Thank God for the extra layers of repetitive nonsense, but hey, I guess what would we do without it, right? The numbers have been crazy low on views, so if you like the channel enough to have notifications on and you'd like to, you know, enable these notifications, it'll give you a heads up when I post because Lord knows YouTube is going to add a fourth layer of this crap later. Anyways, if you choose to do that, thank you. All right, so back to the humanimals. A humanimal is just as the name implies, a human who through time and radiation exposure appears to have changed mentally into a beast, but physically stayed somewhat human. From afar, you would be forgiven in thinking it's just an injured person crawling around, but as you approach them, you would begin to notice something is very wrong with this group of people you have stumbled across. And it's also about the time a cinder block hits you in the face and you get knocked out and eaten. Humanimals appear to be mainly feral humans. To become a feral human would require a multitude of variables coming together in just the right way, because if they don't, you're really just a socialized cannibal. But these creatures seem to have left the realm of human sociability long ago and formed their own separate subspecies from Homo sapiens. So let's examine their behavior for a moment, because there is some striking similarities between them and another larger cousin they have. Watching this creature, we can see that clearly they are still social beings as they travel in packs, moving through either the frozen wastes or even the desert. They search the area looking for anything to eat up to and including humans. However, how they move is interesting as they seem to have regressed out of the human pack mentality and aligned more with an ape-like mentality. This is shown when some packs actually have a silverback variant who is the largest of the group who seems to lead them. Now this is not to say that this trait doesn't exist in humans as clearly we are bound by our own nature and subconsciously will equate larger size to being a better leader. But the feral humans actually exhibit this behavior and it really seems to be the only game in town. This also would suggest that like most apes, the leader more than likely had to fight his way to the top. Anyhow, upon coming into contact with humans, humanimals usually have two modes of descending upon their prey. The first way is the standard rush them. They will run at a person and begin their attack. While there is clearly some brain areas that have been reduced, they still appear to be smarter than most other animals in the waste as they're able to pick up objects and throw them at targets. And believe it or not, this is a massive leap in intelligence. Most animals do not understand the use of inanimate objects being used as a weapon, but primates typically do. In fact, kind of a cool thing, currently there are some orangutans that have been seen entering the Stone Age and using stone tools. The second mode of attack is just a straight ambush. The subspecies of humanimal that lives in the Caspian Sea area will bury themselves and wait for prey. Should anything get too close, they will burst out of the sand and begin their attack. Due to this surprise mode of attack, they really actually have a successful kill rate, and as such, they have become fairly successful predators in the wastelands. One of the things that I thought was exceedingly cool when first encountering the creatures, like I actually was like, oh, that is pretty cool, was their similarities to the librarians. In my earlier episode covering the librarians, we see that they are highly mutated creatures. Now, an argument could be made that they are actually descended from apes, but I disagree due to the fact that they can speak. Well, at least in the novels. And speech, as we all know, is associated with the Broca's area of the brain, and the language is associated with the Wernicke's area. Portions that are not too highly developed in apes. So why would they appear during an even harsher time when speech was not all that necessary? So this poses the question, why are humanimals and librarians similar but different at the same time? To answer this, let's first discuss their internal biology and morphology. The humanimal sports a very human-like appearance. They are similar to chimps as they can walk upright like man but prefer to traverse areas in a quadrupedal manner. They have become moderately muscular similar to that actually of ancient man. They are dirty and possess little to no body hair that we can actually see, thank god. Their heads are bald and their bodies have changed slightly in most areas to adapt to walking on all fours. However, one place in particular has had an extreme overhaul and of course, starting with the feet, which disturbingly has become something this channel is known for, we see that the structures resemble little of their human ancestor's foot. This has been heavily
fully altered to where the person will walk on all fours of their feet and toes, much like that of a canine or feline. The structure is known as digitigrade, which is interesting as it seems to be a structure that appears quite a bit in post-apocalyptic Russia. I'm beginning to form an idea as to what sort of weapon was actually used, but we will have to cover that another time. Anyhow, there are four toes in total with three toes supporting most of the weight. The heel and tarsal bones have elongated to allow the creatures to comfortably walk on all fours. The legs have become more muscular on the human animal as walking quadrupedal actually puts a lot of stress on the muscle and less on the bone and ligaments. As such, the body has adapted and beefed up the area to some extent. This in turn allows them to leap and potentially run faster over short distances than your average human. Thankfully, the human animals still retain somewhat of their humanity and wear something of a loin garment. Now, probably due to the developer's design, but should the creature actually exist like this in real life, this would suggest that modesty is something that is understood, or at least protecting sensitive areas. Because of this, it would be assumed that the frontal lobe of this creature is functional enough to understand social cues or the danger of the elements and how to overcome them. So yeah, moving past that, the abdomen is not what you would expect, but is actually rooted in biology and our own nature. They have quite a few layers of fat protecting them. In current times, we have always assumed that ancient man hunted, ran, and was swole as all get out because of it. Well, this is actually not really that true. Ancient man was more than likely a lot like these creatures as survival over form was more desirable. Just a little bit of extra lore for you there. Anyhow, the back of the creature is fairly unaltered from a normal human's back, which is to be expected, and also the chest kind of falls in line with the same scenario. Coming to the shoulders and arms, however, we begin to see some slight changes. As you might expect, the usage comes with more muscle. The shoulders appear to be larger now that they are actively being used for locomotion. The same can be seen with swimmers who put a lot of stress on their shoulders to perform, so this explains why the muscle mass has increased in the area in the human animal as well. The triceps appear larger than the biceps, but again, Again, this is because they are being used more in a pushing motion against the ground. One of the things that I did notice is that the elbow appears to sort of stick up and away from the body. This could either be used for defensive or offensive purposes, as in hitting somebody with your elbow, or it could be that it provides a better connection point for the actual arm muscles and forearm muscles. Speaking of forearms, they too have become larger. They now serve as a third and fourth sort of calf muscle for the body. The hands have elongated and become much larger. The bones would clearly need to have become thicker as they are now used for walking, and they have lengthened as well. At the ends of these hands sits the creature's main offensive ability, its large claws used for slashing and disemboweling prey. Moving up to the neck, we see that the muscles have become more defined and for good reason. A human's neck, unless they work out, does not actually support that much weight. Our spinal column does this as the skull sits on top of the spine. However, when a creature begins to walk in a quadrupedal motion, this puts more weight on the neck, and as such, the body adapts with more muscle muscle packed on to now support the head that is held over the body. Prolonged evolution of this style of walking would cause the connection point to begin to move to the back of the skull rather than the base of the skull, which can lead to a decrease in brain size. More than likely, the human animals will lose their humanity or really what's left over from their ancestors through time. The head of the human animal is where a lot of similarities with humans ends. Their head is completely bald, lacking any hair or even eyebrows for that matter. Instead, the brow bone sticks further out over the eyes, offering protection that the the eyebrows once did. The eyes are almost pitch black with a very small light colored iris. They have also sunken into the skull. It's interesting because they actually do appear more ape-like because of this, and just like the librarians, they seem to have a tapetum lucidum used for hunting at night. Their noses have become more pressed flat against their faces and their nostrils have become much larger. Perhaps this allows them to also hunt by scent, suggesting a larger olfactory bowl for processing incoming information. The mouth appears to have a split running down it and a complete lack of lips. With the lips out of the way, the human animal could, in theory, produce a larger bite. This bite is also more lethal as the teeth have become almost daggers, suggesting a completely carnivorous diet as opposed to their human ancestors' omnivorous diet. The interior biology of the human animal has everything to do with the brain. It is my belief that certain areas of the brain have regressed and others have been increased. Due to their harsh environment, human animals' bodies had to make a choice, adapt or die. And with radiation levels inducing genetic mutations quite regularly, it seems adaptation was forced upon most caught out on the surface. There are three main areas of the brain in ascending order. The reptilian brain responsible for pure instincts, the mammalian brain, and then the primate brain. Obviously the primate brain is where we sit now and there are varying amounts of brain tissue in this area. Humans have the largest primate brain and apes are the ones really with varying sizes. All would typically possess the mammalian brain areas as well, but it would definitely seem that the primate brain is the one that has been reduced to some capacity in human animals. This is mainly because these areas of the brains are not that necessary for 
survival. It helped humanity ascend to the top of the food chain, but honestly, it was a large risk for our bodies to take in developing a brain as large as we have, but luckily it all worked out. In this subspecies, however, their evolutionary path has taken them on a different route. Because of this, their overall intelligence is lower, and they do not see their human ancestors as their kin, and will really eat them if they come into contact with them. So bringing it back to the librarians, what I find incredibly fascinating is their similarities and how it suggests a two-pronged forced evolution in humans. In Moscow, nuclear weapons were used but shot down, which is why we see most buildings still standing. However, due to high radiation levels, it's evident that this still wasn't enough to spare the city. Another weapon used appears to be biological in nature, suggested by the mutations inflicted on multiple creatures. This combined with the rapid mutation of the humans caught out on the surface, which may have yielded these librarians, who were larger, stronger, and more lethal than their human ancestors. But then, why do humanimals not look like this? I believe it has to do with exposure to radiation, but also the biological weapon. When the weapons were dropped, it was very clear it could have gone into rivers, and as we know, most rivers flow towards the oceans. But they also seem to flow north to south, with the exception of the Nile River. This biological weapon could explain why we find humanimals in two very different places. The first being only a hundred or so kilometers outside of Russia. Here the exposure levels would be low simply due to distance, but radiation would still be present. It should also be noted that there is an unknown chemical in the area that could have leaked out into the surrounding area as well. This in turn altered the DNA of the person, but not so much to an extent that it created librarians, but instead a midpoint between humans and a librarian. Wondering about the Caspian Sea? Well again, rivers could have carried this biological agent through many of the ecosystems. Humans could have consumed the surface water inducing these changes. So this could be a reason that the well is so jealously guarded in the Caspian Sea area, as this is the only source of clean water. So here's what I believe what makes the most sense to me concerning the human animals. They are simply smaller librarians due to their levels of exposure. It's clear the biological weapon used on Russia as well as the nuclear radiation induced these changes, but it's not so much that they completely altered their human forms. Their genes were changed, and as such they changed over just to pure survival. This in turn led to a reduction in thinking power and certain portions of the cerebrum being decreased in size, ultimately yielding the human animal. Part human, part beast, very hungry. So thank you guys for watching. I hope you enjoyed my video over the human animals and my proposed idea as to why they even exist whereas the librarians exist not too far away. I know I'm harping on this, but smash that notification bell if you enjoyed it. It's stupid and it's dumb that I have to ask this, but YouTube's platform, YouTube's rules, I suppose. Anyways, if you are new and enjoyed, subbing is a great way to keep up with the channel. And if you are a regular, leaving a like and a comment also helps because let me pose a question. How do you think they evolved out there? I mean, it's only been about 22 years or so, so that is some intense genetic mutation. I am IMO, everyone should just be a giant cancerous cell by now, sort of like what's under D6. Anyways, I will drop my Discord, Twitter, and Patreon links if anyone's interested in checking those out, and as always, I would like to thank my patrons. At the Scientist tier, we have Arulam Lupe, and next up, it's RTM Chiornage. And of course, it's not a spoon. Our residents are A. Laurentis, Greater Genes 83, Oz Hickman, and Richard Muhlenberg. Holding it down with their PhD in genetics, we have Allison Casparo, Andrew Lawson, Divine Whisper, and Laffy No Skill. With their Masters of Biology, we have Adam Hartswick, Brendan Brotherton, Cameron Smith, Cough Syrup, Edgy McGee, John Russo, Scott Grant, The Rin of Lies, The Otter Man, and Zervelian. And last but not least, with their Bachelor's in Morphological Sciences, we have Add to the List, Ahigao Comics, Alex the Gun Guy, Anthony Charles West, Anthony Wolf, Captain Gas Mask, Dustin Ellis, Eric Scott Gillies, Fruit Eater, Molten Tarts, Professor Bennett's, Riot, Russell McBride, The Original Fat Ass, and Trixie Lulamoon. Thank you guys for your continued support. And just again, a huge shout out to my patrons because Add Apocalypse 2.0 is upon us and these guys are definitely helping out with these education loans. Anyways, thanks for watching guys, and I will see y'all in the next one.